the inside story of the life or death race for a COVID-19 vaccine on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Greg Zuckman has been at the Wall Street Journal for 26 years, three-time winner of the Gerald Loeb Award, the highest honor in business journalism. And this new book is A Shot to Save the World, the inside story of the life or death race for a COVID-19 vaccine. And I've come to know that Greg specializes in these outsized characters who take on uh, take on the odds. And several books, all of which we've interviewed him for, but there's the entrepreneur wildcatters who beat the big oil companies to fracking. That's the frackers, the new billionaire wildcatters, the most successful investor on Wall Street that nobody's ever heard of, who's averaged 38 uh, percent return after fees, which I joke is better than Madoff's fake trading. The man who <laughs> solved the market, how Jim Simons launched the quant revolution. Also, how one investor made 15 billion bucks off a trade that foresaw the mortgage crash of 08. And that's the greatest trade ever, the behind the scenes story of how John Paulson defied Wall Street and made financial history. And then a sports book, Sports Heroes Who Overcame the Odds, co-authored with his teenage son, both of whom we uh, had on the show. His son was a much better interview. Rising <laughs> Above, How 11 Athletes Overcame Challenges in Their Youth to Become Stars. And I got to thank Greg again. He wrote a blurb for uh, Madoff Talks. Um, which is on the cover, so that meant a lot to us. This is the fifth time you've been on, Greg. It's an honor, and and, and I wrote that blurb because I enjoyed the book, so uh, for no other reason than that. The audience needs to know that. Yeah, very nice. Um, so you strip politics out of this, uh, which makes it really a feel-good uh, book. Uh, and uh, and I, what went right on the big picture that made this happen? Yeah, and that is the emphasis of my book. There were so many articles and even books about what went wrong, and I thought I'd try to do something a little bit different, and that's celebrate the science and the researchers and the entrepreneurs and the executives. And I don't think there's enough appreciation of the risks they took, of the innovation they're responsible for, the creativity, the stubbornness. Uh, and that's kind of what my book is about, how we got these vaccines so quickly um, and in appreciation because frankly, um, it didn't have to be that way. We, we, we maybe take it for granted a little bit, but um, it could very well have been the case that we'd still be waiting for an effective and, and, and safe vaccine. So my book is about how it all happened. Normally, I guess it's five to eight years or even more for a vaccine to clear the whole process, right? How great an accomplishment was this and how did they cut it so short? And I know part of the answer to that is just the core technology been under under research for years, right? The messenger RNA. Yeah. So so the average vaccine takes ten years to develop, and this one in three hundred and thirty days from the time this virus was sequenced in January two thousand twenty to um, to the time we had a, a vaccine. It's crazy. It's crazy. So. I, I'll give you two explanations for why it was so fast. Uh, we went we went slow and we went fast, meaning that there was years, even decades of work that on these approaches, especially like you said, the mRNA approach. Um, I start off in the late 1980s with a gentleman named John Wolf. John Wolf is a was a specialist. He's, he's, he's since passed away. He actually passed away in the middle of COVID, not from COVID, but from cancer. But John Wolf um, tried to help children with genetic abnormalities. And he started playing around with this thing called messenger RNA, which is a molecule which we all have inside of us. It delivers the genetic message from parts of our cell to where it produces proteins. It keeps us alive, basically, this, this molecule. And he said, well, what if we could create it in the laboratory, just like we have like sugar that's synthetic that we create in the lab. Maybe we could create this messenger RNA to deliver a message to our body and the body would be to create a protein. And in this case, the, the protein is the, the spike protein. It, it teaches us the, the body's immune system to ward it off. So the answer, going back to your question, is that there was work going back to at least the 1980s and I write about it in the book. But the other explanation for why we got this vaccine so quickly is that there was a lot of money available in 2020. And, and that's important because we were able to do things simultaneously. Never in history were, a, were we able to do things simultaneously. In other words, develop, test, and manufacture a vaccine at the same time. And that just costs a lot of money. And that's the explanation for that. We threw a lot of money at this thing, and it was, it was a good investment. 
does is warps operation warp speed res, responsible for that the, the 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 funding and the um the urgency well i would argue that it was helpful but um first and foremost investors were were important we're talking about uh, venture capital over the years, getting behind companies like Moderna and BioNTech, and those are the two key companies here that developed the vaccines, but also you and me. Um, um, average investors, we stepped up, not me personally, but those who believed in Moderna, those who believed in BioNTech. In, in May of 2020, Moderna was running out of money, did not have money to produce a vaccine. It went to the government, it went to the Gates Foundation, it went to Merck, no one wanted to work with them. And in the end, they went to Wall Street. They went to Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley sold $1.2 billion of shares, passed it on to their clients, and they took that money and ran with it. So later, Operation Warp Speed was very important. But early on, it was you and me. Wow. How did you get inside these organizations? Um, so a lot of pleading, a lot of <laughs> requests. On the one hand, I, I, I didn't want to interfere with their clients. I was doing this real time. I've, I've never done this before where I'm yeah. writing a book while something important was happening. So that was a challenge. Um, there were a lot of researchers, company executives, government scientists who wanted to talk. They realized they were doing something historic, but there were others that were much less uh, eager to talk to me. So I had to um, w get get as many people involved in their, those efforts as possible. Eventually I broke through, but there were some let's say University of Oxford, a few others that were reluctant to talk to me. And it, it just took a lot of effort to, to get inside. Yeah, it is amazing because it came out right after the whole thing happened. Um, in looking at, you don't talk about politics, but some of the things that uh, were barriers or whatever. First, I want to I want to ask about Wuhan in, um, in, in China. And does it, does it matter if it was out in the bat market versus uh, gain of function uh, leaking out, or to me, the big thing is the cover up initially that allowed it to spread so rapidly. Yeah. So when it comes to the origins, it's a funny thing because it's like the one thing in the world where both the the far right and the far left agree. Um, they both are skeptical of China and the government, and they believe that China either created this thing or. Um, either intentionally or, or unintentionally, and then it leaked out. I'm of the view, I agree with uh, mainstream science. Mainstream scientists will tell you, and these are virologists, these are people that study this kind of thing, they say there's an 80 or 85% chance that it evolved naturally from an animal. Right. In other words, there's a possibility that it did leak out, not, not intentionally. There's no way China would say, oh, we're going to create this lethal virus and then we're so certain it's not going to spread in our own country. It's going to spread elsewhere. Now, nah, they probably didn't do that. Maybe it, it, uh, in, it unintentionally leaked out. And that's kind of what you had suggested. And there's a possibility of that. But historically, we get a lethal virus every five, 10 years. And sometimes we just don't know the origins of the, the, the animal host for a while, like even AIDS. I mean, uh, you and I go back. I remember People were talking about the U.S. Army. People were talking about the CIA, the KJ, KGB, because we also didn't have an animal host. Um, so I do think eventually we're going to find the animal host for this virus. But I'm not certain. But to your point, there still was a cover. Let's let's be clear. The Chinese still um, dragged their feet. And that is very important. Dr. Fauci um, was a hero, I think, back in the AIDS era. He's been around that long. How did he become a villain? Is that just politics? Is there anything more to it than that? Oh, wow. That's a tough question. So it's funny. Was he a hero back then? I mean, he was vilified in the, during AIDS. Um, oh, okay. AIDS activists, they did things like they, they threw blood at the guy. They, they, they treated him mercilessly. And it's um, if you think he was treated unfairly or harshly when it came to the COVID crisis you should go back in, in in history it's awful how they treated him and and frankly he owns up to a lot of mistakes back in aids um the whole issue was whether patients should be involved in the testing protocols and being and be allowed to um be in trials for drugs back then when they had aids and the scientists said no because that will obscure the, the results and the people who had aids said we're desperate here um but that's a whole another issue but so when it came, came to this crisis, I think with everything, Jim, we're looking for someone to blame or people yeah. to blame. It's a sad state we're in, and it's both sides. There's always somebody to blame, and you know, 
Biden inflation. I mean, did he contribute? There were mistakes made for sure, but there's inflation everywhere. I, I just think that um, Fauci became the, the blame and, and there were mistakes made. They'll say early on, that Fauci and others said, don't wear a mask. And then later they yeah. changed their view. Um, but I would argue that's science and mistakes are made in science. So we have to cut these people some slack and acknowledge it's a once in a lifetime crisis they were going through. Yeah. And, and again, it makes your book much better that you don't have to spend the whole book talking about these kinds of uh, things. We're talking. Well, about yeah, yeah. And listen, I'm a centrist, as you, as you know. So I, I, I try not to pick sides. I try to yeah. tell the story as it was. Talking with Greg Zuckerman of the Wall Street Journal about his book on the shot to save the world, the development of the vaccine in under a year, 330 days, I think he said. Uh, we'll be right back. The book is A Shot to Save the World. Greg Zuckerman of the Wall Street Journal wrote this book contemporarily with the development of it. I want to ask, uh, get into the, the science a little bit to help people understand this. But before I do that, on the business side, it's kind of my understanding, corporate pharmaceutical development, vaccines are a low margin business and they're a one-time shot or they're once a year. And all these drugs that you get like um, blood pressure or cholesterol, you take for the rest of your life. And those are much more profitable. How how big a problem is that return on investment disincentive to the vaccine issue? It's a really good point. So when I kind of went into this book, I kind of the big question I had was, where's Merck? Where's Sanofi? Where's GSK? Those guys are the vaccine giants. Why am I writing about this company, Moderna, up in Cambridge? Yeah. No, never heard of. Never produced a single vaccine or drug. What about this Biontech? Biontech's not even a infectious disease company, they're a cancer company, and yet they're the ones who developed the Pfizer vaccine. Well, what about this little dinky company, Novavax, in, in Maryland, it was stock was at $3 a share? Where, where are the giants? And that's the answer you had suggested. The giants generally don't really care that much about vaccines because you give them once every lifetime, once every few years, you don't charge that much. What if you spend all this time and effort and it doesn't work. What if the pathogen goes away? Are you going to put all this work into it? I, I, they would rather um, rely. They'd rather develop drugs and, and for, for things like 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 high blood pressure. And I, I take a statin every night, so I, that's a better business. Which so that helps explain why these unlikely characters that I write about in my book are the ones who save save the world. Now, I want to see if we can help people understand the biology, because I, I don't understand that at all. Um, here's my con how I conceptualize mRNA, that it's like a Microsoft Windows platform that you can plug different applications, in this case, different diseases, if it works out. How do you explain the science underlying this? Yeah, so, and, and, and keep in mind, I'm not a science guy, so right. I write my book for the average person person as well as the scientist, but I had to learn this stuff, but um, I try to make it quite simple. Let, let's first explain what a vaccine is. A vaccine is merely an education of the body's immune system. We try to introduce some element of uh, a, a virus. In the olden days, we would actually introduce the, the virus itself. We would weaken it or kill it, attenuate it. But there were some viruses like AIDS and, and, and others that's just a little too dangerous. And it's costly. It takes a long time to do that. You know, fast forwarding, first fast forwarding, we could have done that for this virus. It just takes a long time and it's expensive. So they developed uh, other ways. And one of the new ways is this mRNA. And mRNA just, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a molecule, messenger RNA, and it sends a message to the body to create a protein. And pro proteins keep us alive. The key is we introduce the protein, a key, the key protein from this virus, and that's the spike protein. The idea is, all right, immune system, we're going to teach you about the spike protein of the coronavirus. Why? Because then if you ever encounter the coronavirus, you'll say, aha, I recognize that spike protein. I had that vaccine a while back, and it taught me about the spike protein, and I, and I can identify it, and I'm going to target and, and attack it and protect the body from it. So the whole idea of mRNA vaccine and, and, and mRNA, any kind of mRNA vaccine, eventually, hopefully, we'll have other mRNA vaccines and maybe even drugs, is to introduce a protein to the body. 
um, to tell the tell send the message to the body. Hey, go create a protein, and the protein in this case is the, the spike protein. And then you're off to the races. You have taught the body's immune system to protect it. So the whole idea is to send a message. That's why it's called M messenger RNA. And the message is to create a specific protein. In this case, it's the spike protein. And and the thing is that you can put other messages in there eventually, right? That's the that's the where this thing is going to be leveraged, right? Eventually, we can. Yeah, they're working on Moderna and others are working on other vaccines for other viruses. Let's say it's something called RSV, which kills elderly and it kills babies every year. CMV, the flu, other kind of things. Hey, if you can do uh, send messages to the body, you can create any kind of message to the body to create any kind of vaccine or therapeutic. That's the hope. That's the goal. Frankly, Moderna has been around since 2010, and this is the only thing they've produced. So let, let, um, um, let's see what happens. And that's where I was going to go next, which is people think this is this was this one year wonder, but actually this was like a twenty year overnight success. Yeah, more than that, even yeah, uh, it is fascinating the, the the progress. And listen, my book is as much about innovation and it's about creativity and it's about characters who who have um, patience and somehow ignore the experts because the experts all said, "Don't waste your time on mRNA." It's, it's, it's easy, easy to forget now, but mRNA has saved the world. But um, the, the thing about mRNA is it gets chopped up by the body and eliminated within moments, um, this molecule. So it, either naturally within our body when it transports this message within the cell or when we introduce it. So the traditional scientists in the world said, well, well why are you wasting your time in mRNA if it gets eliminated by the body so quickly? But it, so it took some really stubborn... Um, persistent scientists to say, you know what, we're going to figure out a way. And that's why my book is about how they, how they figured a way to work with this mRNA. I was struck by the similarity uh, from the Frackers book, how these guys beat big oil. And these are uh, some characters again in these small firms who beat big pharma. It's a great point. I was writing this book and I'm deep in my basement in New Jersey. And I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, this is really similar to my book, The Frackers. And then most people would say, well, how the heck is energy, oil and gas, dirty oil and gas, similar to you know biotech saving the world? But it is. It's, it's stubborn, creative people ignoring the conventional wisdom. It was the same thing with The Frackers um, in that book. Everyone said, don't, don't target shale. Shale is this, this layer down deep below. It's got oil and gas, but obviously it's a waste of time trying to get oil and gas out of this layer. And there were some stubborn people who ignored the experts and the same exact thing with MRA. In the moderna Bientech uh, partnership, you obviously got big farmer and you've got, you know, entrepreneurial kind of uh, startup mentality. Who, who contributed what or how did that come together? Yeah, so that was um, the uh, founder of Biontech, a guy named Uger Sahin, a um, Turkish immigrant to Germany. He got really nervous and scared in January 2020. He was convinced there was something bad coming, probably a, a global pandemic. And he convinced people at his company. It took him a little while. They weren't, uh, didn't believe as much as he was. They weren't as concerned. But eventually they said, we're going to develop a vaccine. But they were a small company. They were a cancer company. They never did infectious diseases. They needed a partner. So Uger Sahin got on the phone and he called a guy named Phil Doritzer. Phil is a senior scientist at Pfizer and they'd worked together. They were trying to develop a flu vaccine. And Phil said, Uger, don't waste your time on this new coronavirus. What if it doesn't turn in, out into anything? Remember those previous coronaviruses, MERS, SARS, others, other pathogens, Zika, they, they all petered out, right? So Phil told Uger, don't waste your time on this thing. And Uger, to his credit, persisted, and he, and he reached out to another scientist at Pfizer named Catherine Jansen, and she was much more concerned, and she believed in the approach, the mRNA approach, and together they, they launched this partnership between BioNTech and Pfizer, and the rest is history, but um, it's one more reason to appreciate the miracle of these vaccines, because it could have been, what, what, what if Catherine Jansen had, like her colleague said, yeah, no, nah, Uger, don't waste your time on this vaccine we may not have all had i've got the pfizer vaccine inside me that may not have been possible so there were so many things that could have gone wrong or needed to go right that um, we need to appreciate only good luck we had in this whole uh, last several years yeah next segment coming up with greg 
The book is a shot to save the world, the inside story of the life or death race for a COVID-19 vaccine. And so they, they come up with 94, 95% efficacy, and even they were completely stunned, right? Yeah, it's easy to remember. It's, it's, it's easy to forget, but um, they, the people, the scientists, the researchers behind the vaccines would have been happy with 60%, 65% yeah. efficacy. If you remember, you know, the flu, that's about what the flu is. And we we're in the middle of a global pandemic. We, we, it wasn't clear w whether we would get any kind of vaccine. So they would have been happy with much lower efficacy. And they were stunned. Yeah, I, I have this scene in my book, and it's pretty dramatic, I think, where, where they were shocked. Um, Oxford and uh, University and AstraZeneca, I don't know if I pronounced that right, did not have success in the end, right? What was the difference there? Well, I would argue that they did have success. We just don't need it in the United States. The Pfizer and um, the Moderna vaccines are just so uh, effective and protective that we don't need any others. We, we also have a little bit of the J&J &J for those people that want one shot, and that's a good one, too. So when it comes to Oxford, they were in the lead. Early on, it looked to everybody in the world like they would be the ones to develop a vaccine uh, first. And in the end, they did produce a vaccine. It's just not as effective. But it, in places like Africa and elsewhere, um, it's embraced. It's it's pretty good vaccine. It's also cheap. And it doesn't have to be kept at cold temperatures and um, as opposed to the mRNA ones. Um, and their approach is a little different. They, like the J&J &J folks, they developed a vaccine in which um, it doesn't use mRNA. We don't um, use this molecule to send a message, but we use a virus to send a message. And it's still the same message. Hey, body, go create the spike protein as an education um, to, to the immune system. It's just that they don't use mRNA to send that message. They use another kind of virus. Uh, they use a chimpanzee virus. It basically it just transports the genetic message. And you say, well, why would you use it? In, you would actually put a, a chimpanzee virus inside you. And when it, when it comes to the JJ vaccine, you're actually using a, a cold virus. And the, the answer is because it's been genetically modified so that it's not dangerous. And viruses are a great transportation method because they get into your body and they spread. That's the whole idea of a virus that's what they're made, meant to do so the people at oxford and at j j said all right we're going to try this other method where um we have a virus that sends the genetic message to create the spike protein and it's a it's a pretty good um vaccine it's just not as good as the mrna ones but listen if those are the only ones we had in the world we'd all be rolling up our sleeves for the oxford and the j j vaccines how unusual is over 90 percent for a vaccine uh it's unusual um, there are some that are, are quite good, um, tetanus and some others, but yeah, l look at flu. I mean, flu every year, it's around 50, 60%. So one more reason to appreciate uh, these vaccines. Explain what pro uh, spike protein means. Sure. That's just a, um, an element, a, uh, the unique characterization, characteristic, I'm sorry, of this virus. And it's a protein um, that looks like a spike that um, is used, it latches on. It's a key one and for all kinds of reasons. It's, um, it's unique. It looks different. It's just one of the unique characteristics. Um, I, I make a comparison in my book that um, it's the kind of thing where like, let's say, I don't know, um, Tom Brady's chin. A lot of people, you, 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 you just look at that chin. Let's say you highlight that in a photo. You, you know that's Tom Brady or you can think of other body parts. I use some other actresses in my in my book, Kim Kardashian's um, Derriere, maybe. You have just a picture of that. You say, okay, that's Kim Kardashian. Same kind of thing with the spike protein, the body. All the body needs to do, the immune system, is is see that spike protein and, they, and it says, aha, that's a coronavirus. I'm going to go target that thing. So it's just the unique characteristic of uh, this virus. How did these um, little firms, particularly Moderna, uh, able to scale up to the manufacturing level uh, that, you know, I mean, we're talking billions of doses. Yeah, it was really hard. Um, they wanted a partner. They, they reached out to all kinds of parties, Merck, others, and we're talking spring of 2020. They said, hey, we're a small company. We've never done a vaccine or, or a virus or, or, or a drug. And, and frankly, they failed time and time again over the years. 
we need some help here. And no one was really willing to help them. So they said, they, they pulled up their bootstraps and said, we're going to have to do this ourselves. And they went all out. Um, I know people there that they, they've been just going all out since then, 2020. They're, they've killed themselves, they're emotionally drained. People with stage four cancer that kept coming into the office during a pandemic, taking the risk. So they said, all right, no one's going to help us. We've got to do it ourselves. So, um, and, and what, what's the reward they got? Well, their stock went crazy. So they're very wealthy, but they also got a lot of vilification. There are people that say they've made too much money. There are people that say they need to share their intellectual property. There are people that say they've, they've harmed, they, they've put a chip inside me and Bill Gates is controlling me and all the conspiracy theories. And they have security. The executives need security, needed security um, because of the crazies. So here they went out all out to, to save us all. And, and as a result, they've gotten criticized often. So my book, in some ways, is an acknowledgement of the, of the researchers, the, the scientists in the bowels of the, this company who, who were creative and innovative and came up with solutions. And yet, um, you know, I don't think they get enough appreciation. The, um, we talked at the beginning about the low ROI on vaccines. What are the kind of profits that Pfizer and, and Moderna, the, the actual, were the actual profits just immense, I assume? I mean, the government was just throwing money at them. Yeah, these are uh, some of the greatest um, drugs slash vaccines um, in, in history. They're the most profitable. And they, they, there was no expectation of this. And it's not for everybody. So like J&J, they went all out. And in the end, the vaccine is good, but not great. It's, it's got some issues, but it's, it's, a, it's a solid vaccine. But they, they don't expect to be making any, any money, money from it. Um, whereas Moderna and um, Pfizer, over $100 billion of, of profits. And people say, oh, that's windfall. And we should be t- yeah. making so much. And it is true that Moderna worked with the government and they used some intellectual property from the government. But... Um, Listen, I'm a I'm a capitalist. I, I I want I want the next Moderna to have incentive to go all out to create some yeah. vaccine or drug to save us all. And if it means over hundred billion dollars of profits, then great. I, I I want the benefit of that drug or vaccine. Did um, Pfizer not participate in warp speed? They participated to the extent that they sold their vaccine to the government through warp speed, but they did not take development money from warp speed they wanted to stay out of the politics they had enough resources they didn't need the money it was an interesting decision so it was a smart decision i think that's part of the reason why they were the first to the market whereas moderna t- needed the development money from from warp speed and there were some bureaucratic stuff i read about in the book that slowed them down so yeah. at, at one point it looked like moderna was gonna be the first but then Pfizer passed pass them in the race. And that's partly because of the bureaucracy that resulted. Operation Warp Speed was a wonderful um, contribution, but it also did in some ways slow things down. Yeah, and I, I thought it took guts to do that because they, uh, part of that was the politics. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what you have to do as an entrepreneur. You described the uh, Moderna French CEO as a fabulous or maybe even Elizabeth Holmes type of person, which is Theranos, of course. What is the fine line between overhype and almost delusion that these guys need and Elizabeth Holmes? Yeah, to be clear, I didn't compare them to Elizabeth Holmes, but a lot of people in the biotech world until 2020 saw Stefan Bensel, the CEO of Moderna, as somebody who exaggerated or maybe even lied. Uh, fraud is a little strong, but yeah, some people did wonder if there was a fraud going on in Moderna. Why? Because for years they said right. they had a great technology, and for years they didn't come prove it. They failed time and time again at a drug using mRNA to develop drugs, and then they switched gears to vaccines, and people were like, ah, uh, we don't like vaccines anyway. You can't make any money. These guys have failed. Oh, now they're saying they can develop a vaccine? Yeah, right. So to your point, as a CEO of a biotech, it, it is a little bit like the frackers too, Jim, because you kind of have, have to be a good salesman or saleswoman um, because it's, you're always going to have some, some success years down the road. It's not like you can say next year we're going to produce something. It's always years of, of technology, of innovation. 
and you have to be raising money all the time. It's like a congressperson. You're, you're always raising money as a biotech, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's, it's hard to do that. So you've got to be a good salesperson. And nine times out of 10, maybe even more, it doesn't work. So you've got that history too, uh, shadowing you. So it's not, not easy to do. And when you're really good, like Stefan Bansell is a great salesman, people come after you. People are jealous. People point fingers at you. So there was a lot that Moderna and, and Bansell had to overcome. And people don't forget that on the eve of this, of, this virus, of this virus and this pandemic, there was so much skepticism surrounding Moderna. Great story. All right, we're coming back with our final uh, segment. Look at the future a little bit. Coming right up. Greg Zuckerman of the Wall Street Journal. First off, COVID is never going to end. It's going to become an endemic or an annual thing. What? Where do you on that? Yeah, I, I, that, that's the hope, actually. Um, Listen, there are already in existence uh, a handful of coronaviruses that caused the cold, the common cold. And I think there's a possibility that they started like this one did originally as some pandemic and then eventually faded into the background. I think that's the hope. And I think that's what will happen here, where you eventually get enough people who've had it. I personally got it for the first time uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And it finally caught up to me and it's catching up to everybody. So eventually enough of us have immunity, hopefully through vaccines, but if not through getting this virus, and then eventually it becomes one of these things where, yeah, you get it. It becomes a cold. For those who are vaccinated, for those who are unvaccinated, it will be worse, um, sadly. So we still need to somehow convince them. I don't know how that 30 percent or so in, in the populace. Um, and then you've got parts of the world where we don't even come close yeah, to yeah. giving them the vaccine and then it'll change it'll morph and there'll be new variants we're gonna have to deal with them so it's gonna be something that hangs around but not something that's gonna hobble us like like this has over the past couple of years which reminds me let me ask you a question we're, we're, we're told all these 90 percent and up and i've had four but two boosters and, and the two shots and mm -hmm. i got COVID right after christmas how how do we claim it's 90 percent and all of us are getting COVID? yeah well at this point it's not 90 percent because of the variants early on it was like 95 yeah. percent from the oh, original okay. strain so it's not 90 percent 90 percent protective right now but it's, it's it's quite protective but the yeah. key obviously is hospitalization and and death yes. and, and and frankly if i don't know how it was for you but if we all get some version of what i just had which was a bad cold i had a flu and COVID at the same time um, uh, they call that something, Corona, Flu, Flu, Fluorona, yeah. Fluorona. Anyway, just trust me, if, if that's the worst and, and it's just a bad cold, then that's fine. We can deal with that. But the key is, yeah. is hospitalization. Do you, are you worried that there's a chance of a, a variant or a sub-variant that's going to blow this up again, that, the, that will beat the uh, vaccine? Uh, listen, I'm a warrior, so it's always a concern. But I have to tell you, I, I wrote, I, I'm at the Wall Street Journal. I was writing articles about Omicron when it first arose. I remember that weekend talking to people within Moderna and, and elsewhere, and they weren't scared. They were nervous. They were like, well, Omicron is like the kind of thing we develop in the lab that um, is like a worst case scenario kind of thing. And yet the, the original vaccine has been able to handle it. They, yeah. they didn't even need to rework. They were, they were thinking they were going to have to rework this thing and, and make it into a, a vaccine targeting Omicron. And we still could if we, if we need to. But it, the original strain, the original vaccine has been able to handle even Omicron, which is just really impressive. So yeah. could there be a new one that rises? Yeah, but we could also read that's the beauty of mRNA. Um, as you would say with the software, we could just change the basis for this thing, send the message to the body, a new message to the body to create um, a, a, a spike protein, which is just a little different, a tad different, and that'll protect us. So I'm very encouraged about the future. Pretty amazing. What are some of the other big uh, illnesses you think that mRNA might be able to tackle? Well, cancer, it, it, listen, I, I hope so. I, I'm, I'm a skeptical journalist, so yeah. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. But I think let's, let's, let's first start with some of these viruses that are, are dangerous and that we're not focused on enough, RSV, CMV. A better flu vaccine i think first we can do that kind of stuff and then yeah the hope is aids the hope is cancer yeah. the hope is some 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 stuff that's 
even it, it hurts even more people. So um, I, I, I'm hopeful. I'm not optimistic. I'm not confident, but I'm hopeful. Do you think that um, you mentioned this is a one in a hundred thing? Do you will, will are you do you think pandemics will stay one in a hundred or will become more regularized? Well, we are encroaching on the animal kingdom. Uh, increasingly we cut down rainforests and such there's more and there's global warming which seems to con contribute to this kind of thing there's more travel around the world than ever before so as a result i do fear we're gonna get not pandemic just the fear of pandemics um and new viruses are, are going to emerge every few years so that's very discouraging and, and worrisome but again mRNA is a wonder and people need to understand and appreciate that so we can adjust and create new vaccines quicker than ever before. So that'll help us. Do you think it's possible that the W we could get the WHO to be in a position where even in autocratic um, countries, you, the labs must be, um, I don't know what the word is, looked at or searched um, all the time? Um, you know, no. there's gain of gain of function stuff going on that could destroy the world, and we have no insight, do we, to the Wuhan lab? No access. Yeah, it's not good. Um, listen, the scientists will say that by accusing the world, by accusing Chinese scientists of creating this thing, and the gain of function scares people. I get it, but the reason they do gain of function. Is to help us. That is the goal because they want to understand these viruses more. Now, you yeah, and I, as a yeah. layman, we could say, "Well, all right, that's that sounds scary," and, and maybe it is. But they would argue that we need to be well equipped for the next pathogen. There's going to be something, some some new virus. So we need to be playing with these things so that we're prepared. You could argue maybe they need to go overboard. I don't know. I'm not. I'm, frankly, I'm not. I'm sophisticated enough and educated enough in, in the world of science to to weigh in on that. But to your question, no. I mean, listen. Look what's going on in Russia and China. These countries um, are uh, have such little transparency. So it is really worrisome. So the scientists will say that's why we need to cooperate with the scientists within China and work with them and not vilify them. We need their cooperation. So we're going the opposite direction by pointing the fingers and making accusations, and we need to work with them a little bit more. Great story. Have you got a next book in mind or yet? Or I don't. As you know, these things are um, passion projects. I need to yes, be... Yes. I, and listen, for this one, I was literally up to 3 a.m. almost every night. I would go to bed sometimes like 1.30 or 2, and I'd feel guilty. So there are a lot of work, and you need to be interested and consumed with the, the project as, as you know and it's not easy to find projects that um motivate you and intrigue you so much i was learning every day i was talking to scientists saving the world i was talking to entrepreneurs and executives or risking it all for billions and, and for the opportunity to save lives so um in some ways it was a once in a lifetime for them and for me as well so i'm waiting i'm waiting for my next inspiration but if audience members will reach out and Give me a good idea. I'm, I'm all ears. I got the same issue. Thanks to Greg Zuckerman. A shot to save the world. The inside story of the life or death race for a COVID-19 vaccine. This has been Business Talk with Jim Campbell. You can go to our YouTube channel, Jim Campbell Radio, and hopefully take a look at my book as well, Madoff Talks, Uncovering the Untold Story of the Most Notorious Ponzi Scheme in History from McGraw-Hill and soon to be made into a Netflix documentary. And on the back cover yeah. is Greg Zuckerman's... Um, Nice blurb. Thanks, Greg. Thanks to our audience. See everybody in the next edition of Business Talk with Jim Campbell.